Thank you, Member. Member for Vancouver, Mount Pleasant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise to speak to Budget 2015. And it is hard to believe, actually, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have responded to some 20 budgets in this legislature since I was first elected back in 1996. And I'm very, very honored to consistently rise in this House to bring the voices of Vancouver Mount Pleasant, a wonderfully diverse community with hubs of vibrant and unique small business corridors, an active urban Aboriginal community, and a strong history of activism to this legislature. In our community, we have a lot to celebrate. Though I must say, not much from Budget 25, uh, 2015. We have historic Chinatown that recognized as one of the largest and cleanest in North America. And I know many members in this house have visited Chinatown, and the most recent visit would have been just this past weekend, where some 10,000 people converged and came to Chinatown to celebrate the Lunar New Year and participated in the parade. At the, right next to the Chinatown is Strathcona, a neighborhood that's always been known to be ethnically diverse, where newcomers from around the globe come and start their new lives. And yes, the east side neighborhood of Strathcona was home to Vancouver's first and only black community and home of the Jimi Hendrix Shrine. And right now, members of our community would like to see an Afro-Canadian cultural center built near the viaduct as a means to revitalize an important part of the Strathcona community history. Further east is Commercial Drive, where you experience Little Italy right in your backyard with the annual Italian Day, amplifying the experience with a host of activities and performances. And the drive is where the ever popular car free day was first started. Granville Woodlands indeed is a hub of community activism. We work hard to ensure that there are services and programs in place to support and meet the needs of the community. If you go on Main Street, like Commercial Drive, you will see creative and innovative shops that reflect the unique character and flavor of the neighborhood. And on the streets of the downtown east side, while you see the challenges that we face, that we face as a community, but if you take the time to look beyond the service, you will see the kindness and the caring that defines the nature of the activism of our community. The people in Vancouver Mount Pleasant care deeply about their neighbors and their values are deeply rooted in the belief for social, economic, and environmental justice. This is demonstrated every single day in Vancouver Mount Pleasant, Mr. Speaker. Our community has continuously called for an increase in income assistance rates to a level that provides an adequate living standard, indexed new rates to the cost of living. Raise the rates have been at the forefront of this campaign. And as you can see in this budget, there is no rate increase for people on income assistance or on disability. But Mr. Speaker, in case if you're wondering though, the government is saying that they cannot have a poverty reduction strategy because they say that British Columbia cannot afford it. But isn't it interesting, isn't it interesting that when it comes to giving a huge windfall of some $230 million to the top 2% earners in British Columbia, this government has no hesitation whatsoever and they found the money, no questions asked. It's not just poverty that our community fights against, Mr. Speaker. Another issue that is consistently brought up to my attention is the issue of affordable housing. We have scores of people who have come through our office seeking safe, secure, affordable housing. In 1993, as you know, Mr. Speaker, the National Housing Program was cancelled. And now we're on the verge of losing federal funding, funding support for the cooperatives as the operating agreements come to an end. 
if we lose the subsidies to co-ops and there is no action taken, the impact would be so significant. Literally thousands, thousands of individuals and families would be impacted. And Mr. Speaker, we simply cannot, cannot let that happen. All levels of government need to work together and understand that the foundation for healthy living, healthy communities begin with a place that you can call home. I recognize, Mr. Speaker, that those who are homeless, shelters is often the first stop on the housing continuum. The average stay at a shelter is up to one month. It is incredible to me that in the Grandview Woodlands area of Vancouver Mount Pleasant, we actually do not have a permanent shelter. The need for permanent shelter in this area has been a theme for years in this community. Every winter, it feels like, I would write a letter to the Minister of Housing and I would call for the heat shelters to be established. Now, the heat shelter that opened at Commercial Drive and Pender Street was full a point the first 12 hours, 12, first 12 hours of opening, Mr. Speaker, and every night they've had to turn people away. The Rain City staff knows and work with all the people in the area, and they know all of the folks who are precariously housed. There is no question that we need a permanent shelter in this part of the riding. Now, we need to acknowledge that while a shelter is the first part of the housing continuum, we know that it is not the long-term solution. We need to invest in building new affordable housing and add to the permanent affordable housing stock. In this budget, I see that the government has booked money from the sale of BC housing assets. And in my writing, the government has embarked on the sale of Stamps Landing, a major social housing complex uh, in the riding. As the minister knows, members of the community are deeply concerned about this and the process that BC Housing has embarked on. They would like to be involved in this process and work with the, the government regarding the future of their homes. They want to have a say and incorporate their vision on what Stamps Landing would look like if it were to be sold and redeveloped. I have written numerous letters to the Minister of Housing on this. In fact, I think since November, Mr. Speaker, and I have yet to receive a response. I've put questions on the order paper and still no response. I, along with the community, would like to confirm that there would be no changes to both the amount and number of subsidies made available to the tenants at Stamps Place for both the short term and long term. Beyond the impact for the existing tenants, we would like to know from the minister and for him to confirm that this plan would not change the rate and the ratio of subsidies provided to this development into the future. As a benchmark, we would like to know how many people are receiving subsidies at this time and their rate of subsidy. We would also like to have a list of the major upgrades that were completed at Stamps Place development. We would like to know if there are any outstanding renovations or upgrades that remain to be undertaken. What is the pro projected cost of the deferred maintenance for Stamps Place? I wish that these budget documents would answer these questions. And when they don't, I wish the minister would respond to the questions that I have put to him on the order paper or the letters that I've written to him so that we in the community know what is going on and what they can anticipate so that we in the community can work with the government on this question. It is a significant question when we're talking, when we're talking about several hundred people, several hundred people would be impacted by the re development of stamps. Mr. Speaker, a courtesy, a simple courtesy of a response would go a long way. 
Mr. Speaker, we would also like to confirm that all the proceeds from the sale of stamps would be reinvested in the provision of similar affordable housing initiatives for low-income tenants that require similar rates of subsidy in the community. The budget document does not tell us that information. It does say that the money is booked, but how will it be spent? And will it be reinvested with a similar kind of housing? And I do think that that's an important question that we in the community ought to know. It is important because we want to ensure that the affordable housing stock to the magnitude in which was provided in stamps would regenerate the same kind of stock in the community. I am very, very concerned that if the sale goes through and the same ratio of uh, subsidies, if not in place in the long term, that would actually mean the nonprofit who made the purchase would have no choice but to increase the rent. And it's not because it's the nonprofit who's failing the system then in that instance, but rather it is the government who's failed to ensure that the subsidy and the necessary subsidies are in place to ensure affordability for the tenants. I don't have a problem whatsoever for nonprofits to run affordable housing projects. I think on the whole, they do an excellent job. What I do worry about though, if the government does not provide the sufficient supports to them for them to do their job effectively, the impact would be felt by the very tenants. And that is the concern that we need to make sure in the sale of stamps and other projects like stamps does not happen. I know, I know that if this happens, we will see an erosion of the affordable housing stock in the community over time. If there's no confirmation of the ratio of subsidy and the amount of subsidies provided to our community, it would mean that there would be a diminishing of affordable housing stock. The last I checked, there are some over 15,000 people on a wait list for safe, secure, affordable housing. The wait list is so staggering that the government no longer keeps a wait list. And budget 2015, what of it? The housing capital fund has been cut by 62%, or $24 million, dropping to uh, $15 million in 2015, 2016. And yes, you have it right, based on budget 2015, the priority for this government is to give a $230 million tax break to the top 2% of the wage earners in British Columbia, while cutting 62% of the housing capital fund, which by the way, is $24 million, and that's about 10% of the $230 million tax break that the top 2% of British Columbians would receive. So how does that make sense to you, Mr. Speaker? Because it doesn't make sense to me, and it doesn't make sense to my constituents. We have record numbers of people who are homeless and are in imminent danger of being homeless. And the government is running around giving a tax break to the wealthiest British Columbians while cutting the housing capital fund. I will tell you, the people of Vancouver Mount Pleasant are against this decision. Not only are they against this move, they want a government that will take action for the needs of most British Columbians and not just a few. And speaking of taking action for not just a few, isn't it time that BC has a universal childcare program? I still remember how the Premier, the now Premier, who was then the Deputy Premier after the 2001 election, took federal dollars earmarked for early childhood development and used it for immunization costs. Those were dollars that were booked, that were supposed to be booked and used for childcare supports. And they were redirected for immunization costs. Universal, affordable, licensed, qualified childcare is good for families and good for the economy. 
The Coalition of Child Care Advocates of BC and the Early Childhood Educators of BC have developed a community plan for a public system of integrated early care and learning calling for a $10 a day child care plan. Many groups and individuals, including the UBCM and the Board of Trade, have endorsed this plan. And in Quebec, 70,000 more women are working since affordable child care came to Quebec. Nationwide, 78% of children in First Nations communities are without a regulated space. Our economy grows $2 for every $1 invested in childcare. And for British Columbia, it's projected to be a $2.4 billion growth in 2020. The $10 a day childcare plan for BC is a good plan. It is an effective plan for the economy because investing in children is the best investment that you can make to build a strong future. And sadly, Budget 2015 makes no provision for it whatsoever. Not only are children not supported for early childhood development, students on the other end of the educational spectrum will now be charged for adult basic education. I have a stack of letters from my constituents who wish to enroll in adult basic education so that they could further pursue educational opportunities as a means to develop their career opportunities. After much agonizing for many of these constituents as they make these decisions, because they're not always easy, imagine how shocked and dismayed they were to learn that effective May 1st, 2015, it would cost them several hundred dollars more to take an upgrade for each course. One constituent wrote to the Premier, and I quote, you have killed my dreams of a better life and you're preventing me from furthering my education, end quote. This is a $5 million cut in adult basic education. That's 2%, 2% of the $230 million that the highest income earners are getting. $230 million that they didn't even ask for. Mr. Speaker, how does this make sense? How does Budget 2015 make sense to anyone when you know of stories like this? And you know these are not just stories, they are the lives of people, people whose real experience that they're living every day. There are other program cuts too, Mr. Speaker. Last fall, the Kettle Society MPA Soci and the MPA Society received notice from Vancouver Coastal Health that they would no longer be funding their mental health advocacy programs. The VCH advocacy program at the Kettle funded two full-time advocates and their manager. The two advocates the Kettle is losing are responsible for meeting all initial requests for advocacy service via telephone or in person. They rotate duties on the intake desk which is open for service 23 hours per week on a drop-in basis. They provide frontline paraprofessional service to mental health consumers in the areas of income and disability assistance, tenancy and housing, debt, income security, resource referrals, legal referrals, income tax preparation, and other many other matters. They help clients apply for and maintain eligibility for seniors' pensions, income assistance, and with applying for persons with disability benefits. They provide tenancy advice, refer clients to appropriate legal, medical, and community services, file income taxes, and help clients maintain eligibility for medical and pharmaceutical coverage. They assist clients with debt issues, help clients request crisis grants for food, clothing, and shelter, and advise clients who are apprehended under the Mental Health Act. And now, that funding for that program, Mr. Speaker, is eliminated. Effective May 1st. Not only that, access to social development offices to pick up checks and other administrative tasks is reduced and limited, limited to mornings only. So if for some reason you're unable to go to the welfare office during the morning hours, you will have to wait until the next day to access your check. Mr. Speaker, while these cuts to the kettle and limiting access to social development offices, the government 
is reducing critical services to those most in need. Mr. Speaker, that is not all. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the February 14th Memorial March to commemorate the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I was at the first Memorial March, and I still remember it. There were so few of us who came out to participate in that march 25 years ago that now, 25 years later, in this last Memorial March, it was beautiful to see some 5,000 people came out to support the family members and the community's call for a national inquiry into the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Of course, a huge thank you goes to all the organizers throughout all these years for their hard work, for educating the public about this critically important issue. I also want to acknowledge the Native Women's Association of Canada and the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action for initiating the call to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to investigate this issue. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights released this report in support of a national inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, stating clearly that the federal government has a legal responsibility to address, and I quote, the underlying factors of discrimination that originate and exacerbate the violence, end quote. The Commission notes that the Indigenous women and girls have gone missing or been murdered at a rate four times higher than the representation of Indigenous women in the Canadian population. The Commission recognizes the need to address, and I quote, the persistence of longstanding social and economic marginalization, end quote and is calling for effective measures to address the social and economic issues of Indigenous women. We need, to, we need effective measures to fight against poverty, to improve education, and employment, and guarantee adequate housing. We all know that the OPAL inquiry not, was not given the mandate to look at the root causes, including the socioeconomic conditions that women face. The OPPO inquiry excluded community members with incredible knowledge and insight on this issue. And in so doing, the government actively prevented the answers that were needed. And while the Commission stated clearly that the OPPO inquiry only touched on one small aspect of the systemic failure, it did point out that all of the OPPO inquiry recommendations need to be implemented. The Minister of Justice said explicitly to the Missing and Murdered Women Coalition that she wasn't going to implement all the OPPO inquiry recommendations, including the recommendation for safe public transportation along the Highway of Tears. We heard this today in question period. Mr. Speaker, we had the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs making unbelievable comments of, and justifying why no action has been taken to bring safe public transportation along the Highway of Tears, to somehow suggest, somehow suggest that there has been no other women that's gone missing or murdered in the last little while, and that somehow is okay to not proceed with this recommendation. And then we had the Minister of Transportation talking about consultation, and only to find out in that consultation process is not one shred of documentation about what happened there. And all of that is just simply poor excuses on not acting, taking action in every effort that we could make as legislators to actually make a difference in the lives of the people in that community. And to say that we understand and that we will commit ourselves to stop, stop any chance of women from the Aboriginal communities from going missing and being murdered. How many more women have to go missing and be murdered before action is actually taken? Are we serious that the justification to not to do public transportation on the highway of tears because there hasn't been another incident of late? That can't be serious. Mr. Speaker, and surely to God, we will stand in this house and say we will not accept that. The Inter-Commission 
on human rights, the American Intercommission on Human Rights, actually call on the government to implement the recommendation from the OPPO inquiry and specifically identified public transportation is needed for the Highway of Tears. Where is it? How long does it take to get a bus to run around, along the Highway of Tears? And I'm calling on this government to find the necessary funds in budget 2015 to do this and to provide the coalition with a timeline of when all of the OPPO inquiry recommendations will be acted on. I'm further calling on this government to take action now to address the socioeconomic conditions that for too long and far too many Aboriginal peoples face and for us to take action to address these historical, historical wrongs and the effects of colonialism. As Don Harvard stated, this is not a matter of choice. Our obligations under international human rights laws require us to eliminate the discrimination which causes the violence and to ensure that Canada's institutions, including the police and the justice system, respond effectively when Indigenous women disappear or are murdered, end quote. Mr. Speaker, in the coming days, three family members, Lorelai Williams, Michelle Pinot, and Mona Woodward, each with poignant stories about their experiences, will travel to Ottawa and participate at the National Roundtable. And they will be in New York to attend the UN Commission on the Status of Women conferences to share their stories. Lorelai Williams is a single mother to two children, is a powerful advocate to the campaign for a national inquiry into the missing and murdered Aboriginal women. She has been deeply impacted by the loss of her aunt, Belinda Williams, who has been missing since 1977. Her cousin, Tanya Hollock, went missing in 1996, and her DNA was found later at the farm of convicted serial killer, Robert Picton. Michelle Pinot lost her daughter, Stephanie Lane. Stephanie Lane went missing on January 11, 1997. The coalition wrote to the Minister of Justice about Stephanie Lane's case, to which they are still waiting for a response. And let me quote from the letter. In 2003, her DNA was found on Robert Picton's farm, but her family was told that there was not enough DNA to charge Picton with her murder. When I say her, this is Stephanie Lane. Eleven years later, in August 2014, Stephanie Lane's family was notified by victim services that there was a change to her file but the family did not receive details until September 2014. At a meeting with the coroner, the family was told that in an, quote, oversight, partial skeletal remains of Stephanie Lane were placed in, R in RCMP stor storage until 2010, when they were tr transferred to storage facilities to the uh, BC coroner's office. The bones belonging to Stephanie Lane were overlooked and forgotten about in a storage locker. The quantity of remains that had been overlooked was large enough to be among the top six amounts of evidence identified from any of the victims whose remains were found on the Picton farm. And what of it? What action? What action will be taken to address this, Mr. Speaker? This is a gross error and misjustice, miscarriage of justice. And we want to know what action will be taken taken to address this. And Mr. Speaker, I see that I'm now going to run out of time very quickly. And I want to say this. I cannot in good conscience support this budget, Budget 2015. I see all of these issues that's been brought to the government's attention time and time and time again. And consistently, they turn a blind eye to it. They don't face up to these issues because it's not their priority. And what is their priority from Budget 2015? Uh, their priority is to give $230 million of tax breaks to the highest income earners in British Columbia. I just got to say, what is wrong with this picture? Surely, members of this House will agree with me that there is something gravely wrong with this. We cannot allow for this to happen. It's not good enough to say, but we did give back the clawback, which was taken away from families since 2002 on the family maintenance clawback for single parents. It's not good enough to just give that little tidbit back and say that it's okay. It's not okay. 
There's so much more to do, and the government has the power to do it. Budget 2015 has the authority to address these issues. Let us work together to make that difference. That is why we're in this house. That's why we all ran for office, to try to make that difference. Each of us have stories to tell from our communities. Each of us have issues that we want us as a collective to address. So why don't we set aside partisan politics Thank you, and do just that, Madam Mr. Speaker.